All right, for those of you who remember my last documentary about Goonhilly, and if you haven't seen it, well, it'll be linked at the end of this video. That is the antenna that handles a great deal of the interplanetary traffic for this facility, including things like Mars Express. And just recently, it was actually handling the uh, all the telemetry and communications from the CubeSats. It is currently in a parked position because the uh, rotation of the Earth has taken the CubeSats that's out of its uh, field of, of vision, shall we say. Um, but in any event, it is going to be once again reacquiring its targets uh, once they come back into view. But that is the antenna. Utterly huge and once again rebuilt essentially from the ground up on a shoestring budget. All right, guys, we are here at Goon Hilly with a rare opportunity to see what's going on with Artemis, with Orion, with these CubeSats just hours after liftoff. Um, a really amazing opportunity. Would you be so kind as to introduce yourself to the uh, viewers, please? Yeah, I'm Olivia Smedley. I'm a space scientist working here at Goon Hilly Earth Station, uh, part of the operations team that has been working on receiving the signal from Orion this morning. It's an exciting moment, isn't it? I it mean... really is, yeah. Um, terribly exciting. Um, it's amazing to have been involved with the upgrade project of Goon Hilly 6 from kind of what it was originally designed for, um, originally built in 1985 for communicating with geostationary satellites. And over the last couple of years, we've been upgrading it and to now see it um, receiving signals from deep space spacecraft is incredible. Yeah, <laughs> no doubt. So tell me, I mean, I assume there's been like a kind of a frenzy of activity ever since uh, SLS uh, lifted off from Cape Canaveral. Tell me what's what's your job been like? What has everybody's job been like since uh, SLS took flight? Yeah, uh, it was a busy time. Obviously, this morning the launch was delayed um, by approximately 45 minutes. Um, so the kind of trajectory data we had um, beforehand had to be, you know, updated according to the um, delayed launch time. So there was kind of that bit of time there where the calculations were being done and getting the updated information in. So that was a bit of excitement there. And then once we kind of began tracking Orion and, and getting the signal, making sure all the uh, equipment was set up to, to receive that. So, I mean, you know, in passing, most of the time people mention the CubeSats and that sort of thing, but that's kind of the focus of what you guys are doing here. So can you tell us some more about these 10 CubeSats, what their mission is and, and what you guys do for them? Yeah, sure. So over the last uh, months, really, we have been preparing for communicating with um, six of the CubeSats. So this morning we have already received signals from three of the CubeSats we are supporting. One of them is BioSentinel, which is actually measuring the impact of space radiation on li living organisms. Also, we have uh, already picked up a signal from Lunar HMAP, which is measuring the dispute distribution and the amount of hydrogen throughout the Moon's South Pole. And we have also picked up the signal from Argo Moon, um, which has HD cameras on board um, to actually um, kind of take images of the interim cryogenic propulsion stage of the SLS. So three really exciting missions which we have um, already seen the signals from. Also we are supporting a, another three of the CubeSats, um, one of which is called CUSP, um, which is, stands for CubeSat Study in Solar Particles, and it's all about um, understanding um, space radiation better, improving our understanding in that area. Also, we are supporting a lunar ice cube, which is looking at the distribution of water on the moon. And finally, we are supporting um, a CubeSat called NIAS, which is a near-Earth asteroid scout, which will be the first CubeSat to reach an asteroid um, with solar sails um, that, it's, that it's using to um, kind of travel to the asteroid, which is super exciting. 
So yeah, I mean, this is a part of the Artemis mission that really isn't discussed very often. And yet, I mean, you guys are handling a big portion of this. And of course, you've done stuff for other things like Mars Express and all that. So now that you're being catapulted into an even closer relationship with NASA, how does this feel? I mean, this is the, seems like the start of something big. Yeah, it's super exciting. And to think this is all kind of based in Cornwall is just incredible because... Um, ever since I was kind of younger, I used to come down on, on family holidays down to Cornwall, visit, you know, visiting the beaches and the uh, beautiful environment we have, have down here. And to add in kind of the space industry and my, you know, my passion that I have for space. So to combine those two in one place is, is awesome. And um, it's really exciting to be, you know, involved with the likes of NASA, um, which you you know, only dream about really as yeah. a kid. <laughs> so you're from Cornwall yourself? Then, I'm right? not from Cornwall originally. I'm from the Peak District. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, I um, kind of have made my way down over the years. Went to um, Bristol University, studied physics, astrophysics there. Um, I've recently completed a master's with the Open University in space science and technology. So um and yeah, now here I am in Cornwall, so um, wow. yeah. <laughs> describe, can you describe some of your job to me then? I mean, yeah, astrophysics sure. and all that, obviously, I mean, we would expect to, to see you at some huge, uh, you know, observatory, planetarium, <laughs> you know, telescopes, that sort of thing. But instead you're here. Yeah. Um, how does that work? Yeah, so I started at Goon Hilly Earth Station about three years ago now um, and was a part of the upgrade process for Goon Hilly 6. Um, so... Um, all kind of the old retro equipment was ripped out, um, lots of um, you know new systems being brought in which needed um, lots of kind of integration testing um, and I was particularly looking at the monitoring control software that we use to control the antenna and all the equipment in the main equipment room. Um, so that was kind of my role throughout the upgrade process and now it's kind of shifted into the operations side, so actually getting to operate the antenna, um, you know, getting to move it into, to move it onto tracking the, these spacecraft and receiving the signals is is great. Yeah, it is amazing. <laughs> so, how long is this mission going to go on for you? The, these CubeSats, how long are they all going to be in operation? How long is Goon Hilly going to be engaged with Artemis? Um, so we will be um, tracking the Orion spacecraft throughout its, um, I think it's around 42 days that it's going to be um, before it kind of re-enters the atmosphere. So we're going to be shadow tracking it, receiving signals, helping NASA out with, with some of the data from that. So um, that's super exciting. Um, the CubeSats we will track um, for as long as, as we can um, throughout the lifetime of those missions. So. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like you've got uh, quite a job ahead of you. Once again, I deeply appreciate the time you've given us t today. And once again, congratulations. This is a huge accomplishment for this facility. Thanks very much. For, thanks very much. Thanks. Okay, we are back with uh, Ian once again. I'm sure most of you guys uh, remember uh, Ian from the last time that we were here, but in any event, we have an opportunity uh, to get a few minutes of his valuable time to talk about the circumstances with the CubeSats and Artemis. So thanks very much for joining us. If you could tell us real quick what uh, what happened this morning, what were things like? Well, yeah, so the, with the timing, uh, it was early hours of the morning that we, uh, we all turned up this morning uh, to see the countdown. Obviously, we were... Um, a little bit uh, dismayed to see that uh, one of the tracking stations was uh, was down, so uh, that was causing a delay to the launch. Uh, but uh, you know, really excited that the, the launch actually happened. But of course, that delay then uh, meant that all of the ephemeris data, the tracking data that we'd been provided by NASA yesterday, uh, was all um, all all out of sync. Uh, so. We had a, a couple of options. Of course, the, the, the ideal position would be uh, to get new tracking data from, from NASA. Uh, but what we did in the, in the interim was we sort of calculated the delta between the, uh, the pre previously planned takeoff time and the actual planned takeoff time. And we, uh, we, we sort of put all of the deltas into, into our computer to, to work out some, some tracking. So that was quite interesting. As um, uh, our job, if you like, was to pick up the um, 
<coughs> that the Orion signal post translunar injection burns are on its way to the moon as it was climbing away from the Earth. And uh, so it was one of those occasions, you know, where you're looking at the spectrum analyzer waiting to see the signal. Uh, we'll be using our uh, pre calculated data with the corrections and uh, you know, the dish hopefully pointing in the right direction. And you know, you look at the spectrum analyzer and you think, oh, is that a signal? <laughs> Maybe not. So you try, you're kidding yourself that there's a signal there, and you know, I'm hoping that it's going to be there. Anyway, with, with uh, uh, a couple of minutes into the um, uh, Orion being over the horizon for us, we got the updates from um, from NASA uh, via ESA, actually, and so we plugged those into the computer. Bam, this straight on, and my goodness, <laughs> the difference when when you saw the signal coming in. So that was. Um, that was our our, um, our 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 moment where we all uh, screamed for joy. So no doubt. Um, <laughs> so when everybody at, at Cape Canaveral were screaming for joy when it launched, you guys were engaged in a frenetic activity here, just trying to get caught up with everything um, to get that signal. Indeed, and this this part of the mission um, is really just helping NASA to get some additional data for the uh, this this. Um, this translunar phase, and to make sure that the the, the um, we you know we can measure that Doppler shift. So um, we we've, we've completed that task now, and that that was great. So then we had a couple of hours to um, to wait uh, until uh, the the uh, the first of the lunar cubesats were released, uh, and uh, although we're not actually scheduled to do actual commanding of the of the cubesats until uh, until later on. We thought, right, we're we're pointing at the uh, at the antenna. Let's see what we can what we can see. So you're receiving communications and also sending instructions that are re relayed to you from NASA. Is that how it works? Or? Uh, so the, these will come from the actual CubeSat operators themselves. So that the um, that's how we, we do that part of the mission, um, and uh, when we're actually dealing with the CubeSats themselves. So um, and uh, so that's that, those. That's in the schedule for, for later today and, and over the coming weeks. Okay, so, I mean, we talked a little bit about some of the challenges you've been facing COVID-wise and such with your staff and that sort of thing. So you've been going into more extensive protocols, perhaps than, than you anticipated even, to make sure that you have the staff you need for this job over the next several weeks? Indeed. Well, we'd have loved to have invited you directly into the control room. But um, yes, we had, in fact, over the last two weeks, we've had five members of staff off with COVID. And uh, that's the most we've had, you know, through the entire pandemic. And uh, so we were panicking a little bit that, uh, you know, we might just have everybody down this week. And so we've reinstated uh, our, our sort of uh, separation. We've got a red team and a green team. Uh, as it happens today, uh, they're back in operation together. We've we've been operating actually with a. Um, uh, some some ropes roping off the room into into two halves, uh, which we've taken out today. But the teams are actually staying separate. From wow, each other. that's uh, a, a lot of protocols. But what we we do, and we've we've now the team are normally sit together. We've moved them into two separate offices. We've got two separate kitchens, two sets of toilets. So, so <laughs> the, the the teams <laughs> stay they're staying separate from each other, and it's just to to have that little bit of um, extra security. And of course, we're all testing again now, so. Um, but, you know, it's just one of those things that we're having to go through. Yeah, it sounds like a challenge, but it sounds like you're rising to the occasion. Okay, so right now, obviously, we're checking out a live shot of Orion and its perspective of, as it looks at, uh, at the Earth. It appears to have caught a lot of sunlight right now, but can you give us an idea? I mean, how far away is it? How far has it traveled? And, and, uh, and does, does everything look good to you? Goodness, well, it's, um, you know, to get out of the Earth's uh, gravitational field, Orion needs to go at 40,000 kilometers an hour. Uh, and it's been doing that now for what, um, probably in the order of uh, six hours or so. Um, so um, you can do the do the the, the math, but um, it's it's uh, unbelievable how quickly it's uh, it's moved away from the Earth. And I think you know this image of the Earth here. We've not seen images like this since you know really the Apollo era. Uh, it's it's rare to get. Um, 
you know, this 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 image that uh, that, that we're seeing. May, you know, geostationary satellites are give us a similar image. That to me looks further than geostationary distance, which is you know thirty six thousand kilometers. Um, it's uh, it's tremendous, isn't it? And uh, I think with the view here that we're seeing, you can see the um, the, the main um, boost motor at the uh, it's disappeared now, but yeah. it was at the top of the screen, uh, and you can see the the Orion capsule there on the left of the screen, and then the European um, uh, service module at the back. Well, um, once again, everything's, uh, as far as you've been, been hearing then, everything's nominal, everything's going according to plan, is that correct? It is, yeah, absolutely. And uh, we'll, um, we'll keep tracking those uh, lunar CubeSats and see, uh, see how they're doing as well. Wow, an interior shot it looks like now that we're getting of Orion. Is, is that, is that kind of what we're looking at here? It like, is, it yes. Like it. I don't know who oh, that, um, that mannequin is there, but um, <laughs> obviously somebody is, uh, I don't think it's a stowaway. Maybe, uh, <laughs> maybe it's like a crash test dummy. I yeah, imagine. I know they're also testing a uh, radiation vest on this and they put it on a dummy actually as well, but I'm not sure if that's what we're looking at or not. In any event, this is uh, truly a uh, it's quite an exciting moment now, no doubt for both of us and for everybody on your team. Congratulations, sir, for uh, for securing this mission. Thank you. Indeed. You look at the, is that a window on the on the right hand side? I don't know whether that's earth shine or sunshine coming through uh through that window, but um, or maybe moonshine even, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to be seeing a lot of unique views that I, I think we probably have never seen before, given what we have access to now in terms of being able to provide footage compared to the way things used to be. Once again, Ian, thank you so much for your time today, sir. It's a pleasure.